it was kind of the realization that, you know, you can't drink tea without water. And you certainly can't drink tea without clean, safe drinking water. And at that point, there was almost a billion people on the planet that didn't have access to clean, safe drinking water. We have been reducing our carbon footprint in our packaging for several, several years uh, with post-consumer waste products, with less weight in our packaging. We changed all that packaging to a plant-based wrapper, which is compostable, that brought the company's carbon emissions to zero. Welcome to Mindful Businesses, presented by Sarahani, and I'm your host, Padia Ayer. In our podcast, we bring to you businesses that are mindful in their practices and processes. A mindful business employs sustainable social, economic, and environmental practices. Today, we have with us Reem Hassani, Chief Brand Officer and Co-Founder of Numi Organic Tea, Activating Purpose. She joins us from Petaluma, California. Welcome, Reem. It's truly a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. An honor to be here. Tea drinking is such an important tradition in many cultures worldwide. With the tea ceremonies in Japan, the Indian chai breaks, you know, several times a day, uh, the tea houses in the Middle East and the British high teas, each culture and country have their own way of drinking and serving tea. Is it known like when tea was first made commercially and sold? Tea has a long history and started in China and India, of course. I'm not a super expert on the history, but I think it started to expand to the rest of the world during the Dutch East India boats, whatever you want to call it, that went to the Far East and then started to bring tea back to Europe. Of course, it stumbled upon Africa and then colonized that whole area. So colonization, I would say, is what brought tea to the rest of the world. What is interesting is that it is such a social event, right, to meet for tea, a tea break, a chai break. And I remember in college going to the cafeteria and drinking what we call a cutting chai, it's a very uh, nostalgic term for most Indians, which especially from the Bombay area, where you drink literally two ounces of tea and you divide it amongst your friends. It's like cut into half. and So they're really literally a gulp each that you drink. Uh, your origins are from Iraq, right? What were the traditions there? They drink mostly Indian and Ceylonese teas from Sri Lanka. I'm very dark and bitter, to your point. My memory as a child is, and when we used to go back and visit, is they would have a pot of black tea on the stove with two pots, one with hot water and the other one with just the concentrated tea, like you're saying. So you would pour the concentrated tea and then pour your hot water over it. Black tea, very strong black tea. And then a lot of milk and sugar, and you know all kinds of ways to make it delicious. And they also drink it in these tikans, which is kind of a Turkish glass cup. I remember my grandma used to drink tea that way and with a lot of sugar. They also drank a tea called uh, Numi Basra, which is a dried lime from that got imported from Oman in the Middle East, in the Gulf, and then comes through the port of Basra in the southern Iraq, and that is a dried lime. And so that is the tea of hospitality, mostly in Iraq. In a lot of uh, cultures in the Middle East, they use it as a spice, like the Persians use it as spice in their stews, uh, same with the Syrians and the Iraqis, but the Iraqis drink it like tea. So they do the same process where they have a pot of concentrated lime. This dry desert lime is a very particular flavor, and then they serve it all day long, which is wonderful because it's a high source of vitamin C. Did they ever add spices like saffron, cardamom, cloves? In Iraq, they add cardamom to their black tea. Uh, and probably other things, but I'm not, uh, we used to just drink it black, personally, in our family, sometimes cardamom. My mom didn't like a lot of spices in her in her tea, but the new me that we named our company after was a lime tea, so they didn't really add anything to that. Growing up in India, the only way I had thought about tea is the black and green and the white teas, which grow on the tea bushes. But now we have peach orange tea, we have saffron lemon tea or saffron 
turmeric tea and ginger turmeric tea. How would you define tea? Is it the process or the ingredients? There's kind of a misnomer about tea because the true tea is the Camellia sinensis plant, which grows mostly in Southeast Asia, China, India being predominantly where tea grows, but also Vietnam and Thailand and Japan and Sri Lanka, like I said, etc. So um, there's some teas that grow in Africa, in Nigeria and Kenya, and then also South America. So those are your traditional white, green, oolong, black, and pu'er teas that come from the Camellia sinensis plant. And of course, how they are processed, the size of the leaf, which leaves they pick, how they dry them, that all defines whether you get a white or an oolong or a black tea. Everything else is pretty much either an addition to the tea. So you might put, you know, and pretty much most tea companies will put a flavoring on top of the tea. So they'll put a peach with the black tea or whatever, peach flavoring. Uh, we don't put any flavorings. We only use real ingredients. That's how you get all your combinations, you know, of different flavored teas. And then, of course, there's a range of herbal. We call them herbal tisans because there's no, technically, there's no tea in them. There's no camellia sinensis plant. So herbs, of course, come from all over the world. And they grow in your backyard. And so mint and chamomile and rosemary and, and sage and ginger, roots, of course. And, you know, so now we're exploring all kinds of options. We're exploring mushrooms. We're exploring, you know, in the tea, the so adaptogens. And Numi, at least us, we're exploring several different herbs and roots and things for health purposes. So people tend to drink tea here in the United States when they're sick. So not to say people are also drinking tea in the mornings and afternoons and evenings and stuff. You know, it's the second most consumed beverage in the world after water. And considering the populations in China, India, it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> right. And mushroom tea, that was the first time I've heard of that. How many different varieties does Numi have now? We have... Probably a good 25, 26 tea bag blends. And then we have some loose teas. And then we also have some drinking chocolates, so chocolate, cocoa. Yeah, we have a lot of teas. <laughs> so you said that tea was the second most popular drink worldwide after water. But in America, we don't have the tea houses like the Starbucks or Pete's Coffee or that caliber. There are a few tea parlors, tea salons like Harney and & Sons and some other brands. But it's really hard to think about a place where people just go for tea and scones or tea and biscuits. Yeah, it's not as definitely not as popular as the coffee culture. It's up and coming. And, you know, lots more tea houses have opened up in the last 20 years that I've been in business than there were before. And more people are familiar with tea, at least at Starbucks too. You know, when Tazo, uh, Starbucks bought a brand called Tazo and that became, you know, popularized. There's also the tea houses of Tivana. I'm not sure where all their locations are, but it's starting to happen. And then people, I think on their own, because of all the health benefits that are always reported out on tea, a lot of people have been switching you know, there are two, three, fourth cup of coffee to cups of tea. That's a big trend. Yeah, that's exactly me. I used to drink a couple of cups of really strong coffee. And now my morning cup of coffee and then the afternoon is the tea. And it depends whether it's a masala chai or if I'm too lazy to make masala chai, I would make a herbal tea with a tea bag. Mm -hmm. So you've been doing this for about 20 years. How did you start this? Were you into f the food and beverage industry? What happened? <laughs> Good question. I was getting my master's in fine arts at the time. My brother was, had been running uh, tea houses in Europe, so he had the more extensive knowledge of tea. And we had been inspired by this dried lime we drank as children called Numi and somebody needed to bring it to the states and so we just decided to do it and um it's a long story but yeah we decided to do it and i did all the artwork for the packaging so that was kind of how we got on the shelves and then we also introduced new herbs to the country like rooibos from south africa and honeybush from south africa so that kind of put us on the map so to speak and then we just kept going from there so your brother was in europe 
and managing tea houses and he came back and he told you hey reem i have an idea well we met up we had a family trip in the grand canyon and so i had told him that i was thinking about doing it and he told me he was thinking about doing it at the same time so it was very synchronistic that we kind of said oh let's do it together so how is that how in your new family businesses have a lot of um uh, challenges especially in terms of boundaries right are you discussing business at a family get together over your you know at your parents house and it can be kind of a bit too much or maybe it's perfect because you can talk about it you have no boundaries yeah we tend to talk about business a lot i mean we still hang out and get together and we're still a uh, loving brother and sister but that's hard because we're very different and uh, we butted heads a lot of times that's the positive about family is you always have to you can't go anywhere <laughs> and then i think the basic trust that you would have with your brother is probably unique compared to a partner that you met in school or at work exactly how did you guys get funding for your business the initial funding we got was from our father who was very generous and he got a line of credit on their house and uh, so we borrowed against that line of credit and then we started to get we got another angel investor at one point and then we started to get a private equity firms and banks support and then we were also partnered gosh i think it's been about 10 years maybe we partnered with jm smuckers the ones who make the jams and jellies Yeah, they invested in the company and became a a large minority shareholder. You said you had some private equity investment. Can you share how much they invested in your company? Sure. I think the first was around 2 million and the next was around 4 million, so something like that. So, how was your experience dealing with a private equity company? I've heard bittersweet stories you want the funding, but at the same time their expectations of how the business should be run could be different than what you and your brother wanted. You know, you have to be aligned in your agenda what you're looking for. Though we had one private equity firm that was difficult to deal with. Smuckers ended up purchasing their shares. You know, they wanted to get out in 3 years and you know, you have you're kind of have a clock on your head and you've got to make sure you you meet the numbers. So that was a tough one. There's different types and different stories, so we had some very good ones as well. So most businesses who started small it's a really important moment that they don't forget. Do you remember your first sale? I don't remember the exact first sale but I remember the first impressive sales and that was to Rainbow Grocery here in San Francisco and to Dean and DeLuca here in Napa Valley. Dean and DeLuca is a very fancy store. It was so exciting to be able to get into that store. And R- Rainbow Grocery is one of the largest natural food stores in the country. So, that was kind of our launch and uh, we were so excited to I remember those days we had an answering machine <laughs> and we got an, a message from Dean and DeLuca saying she wanted everything. We were just so excited about that. You had these products which are amazing. the artwork the graphic your boot set up or your display was impressive but how did they believe that you could actually deliver we had a, a booth at um the San Francisco gift show that was our first show and we had business cards we had the whole bit i remember at the time we hadn't had our invoices set up yet but we got the orders anyway so we just had to figure it out you know a startup business with not any experience you just have to fit you know you know fly by the seat of your pants and you have to figure things out as you go so it's a big learning curve but we managed your teas are unique and differentiated from your competitors because they are organic they use real ingredients than oils yes How exactly are they different? We use a fuller leaf quality tea. Most of the teas in the states at that time and still are pretty small dust and fannings, so the taste is very bitter. And we still use a larger cut leaf and we don't use any flavorings. And then we had these unique herbs that we were introducing to the country. So we were offering a better taste, a better quality, organic. Eventually we became fair trade certified as well, and the flavors were just clean and amazing. So, 
So let's talk a little bit about what it means to be fair trade certified. Of course, you can buy tea from anywhere. You know, you're buying tea from very poor regions, rural regions of the world. People are not getting very paid very much, you know, maybe a dollar a day to pick the tea leaves. When a farm is fair trade certified, you're paying an extra premium on top of what you would normally pay. And that premium goes to a fund for the farmer collective. And that farmer's collective consists of males and females on these farms from what we've seen, and they vote on where they want to spend the money. For example, in India, they've purchased mosquito nets to prevent malaria, a road for the kids to go to school. In China, uh, they built a dormitory for the children who, from the tea estate to go live at the school. Different projects whereby, you know, it's improving people's livelihoods based on what their needs are. So how do you authenticate these or do you rely on the agencies? The agency does their own audits. So they do their own audits, random audits to the farms. And the fair trade organization is very robust and thorough and global in its efforts. So it's verifying and it lets you know which farms are fair trade certified. So besides serving excellent tea, you are also a mission driven company with several impactful programs. One of that is Together to Hope. And I liked your catch line on your website. What is tea without water? When we launched Together for Hope, it was kind of the realization that, you know, you can't drink tea without water. And you certainly can't drink tea without clean, safe drinking water. And at that point, there was almost a billion people on the planet that didn't have access to clean, safe drinking water. So we thought, wow, you know, what an aha moment that we have pretty much taken for granted all of the tea we've been able to sell and all the tea everybody's been able to enjoy because of the clean water. So we decided to go back to our farming communities and find out if that was a need for them, which in Madagascar, where we purchased our turmeric teas, it was a huge need because people were drinking tea from the dirty rivers where animals defecate and things like that. So they collect the water, they go home and they boil it, had never had clean water in their lives and kids were all kinds of diseases. And so we quickly raised funds for that and ended up building 24 wells in these very rural river villages um, in Madagascar. We have a video on it and um, we went there to see the wells. It was amazing. First time in their lives they had clean water. The children weren't sick anymore, can go to school. It was a great, you know, humbling experience to be able to do that in Madagascar. And then our second project was in India in our Assam Tananagon Tea Estate, which is in Assam, India. They had wells but the wells were contaminated because the tables under them were contaminated. And they also had latrines very close to the wells. And the people, the women, the children, the, everybody, they weren't washing their hands, they weren't wearing their sandals, etc. So we implemented a water access sanitation and hygiene program in India. So it was a little more complicated. We partnered with a couple groups, including an on-the-ground non-NGO to train the woman in the village. And then they trained their community in terms of washing your hands or, or wearing your sandals. And that decreased absences from work and school by 80% within the year that it was implemented. So it was a really successful program. How many such wells have you built in Madagascar and worldwide? So in Madagascar, it's about 24 wells, and I think in India is a couple more wells. And then also in India and South Africa, we've also built just bathrooms on the farms where the workers are picking the herbs and the tea. Global warming and climate change are very important to most of our listeners. And NUMI has a climate action plan. What are the key salient features of this plan? When it comes to a manufacturing company, you have not only your facilities whereby, you know, you may be emitting, you know, having carbon emissions, it's also your packaging and your transportation, of course. So there's not much you can do with transportation except make sure you have all your products shipping at the same time so you're not using excess petroleum. But the thing that we did do is we implemented, we have been reducing our carbon footprint in our packaging 
for several, several years uh, with post-consumer waste products, with less weight in our packaging, transferring the corrugated bosses to post-consumer waste. And two years ago in 2020, we changed our wrappers to a plant-based wrapper. And prior to that, it had a layer of plastic and a layer of aluminum. And now it's completely plant-based made out of sugarcane and eucalyptus. And it's also non-GMO, which tends to be a route that a lot of manufacturers take, which is using a GMO-based product, but we are against that. So we changed all that packaging to a plant-based wrapper, which is compostable, that brought the company's carbon emissions to zero. So we became carbon neutral in 2020, uh, knock on wood. And uh, you know, we keep making efforts to uh, reduce packaging in other products that we use and also work on transportation. We're on the kind of measurement of our cell standard. So it's not up against the industry or anything. It's just how can we keep continue to reduce our carbon offsets, our carbon by offsets and by our packaging as much as possible as we go. And when you talk about packaging, you're talking about the tea bags, the packaging which goes around it, the box in which they live in, and the bigger cartons. Exactly. Once it gets to the consumer, it's up to them to choose what to do. You can recycle, you can compost, you can... Everything is compostable and recyclable. So it's up to you to take that extra step, but we're taking our steps, the steps we can as a manufacturer. When you go down the path of being compostable, there are two ways you can go. There are industrial compostable and the garden compostable. This is industrial compostable. It's certified industrial compostable. We haven't tested the backyard compost, but it's a plant material. So eventually, yeah. Or even just as important that it is plant-based, it is important that it is not multi-layer, which cannot really be reused, which is hard to recycle or even biodegrade because there are so many different layers, maybe aluminum, maybe plastic, maybe wax and Exactly. It's hard to do anything with those. And the remarkable thing about this uh, particular material that we've been able to source and we've worked on for 10 years with other manufacturers, it could be used with in anything. It could use, be used for all the bars out there that go direct, all those bar wrappers that go directly into the garbage and landfills. When you source these teas and we talk about organic tea, do these farmers use organic or natural regenerative practices, or they just make sure that they don't add chemicals to the soil or use pesticides? So it's both. They don't use pesticides. So it's all natural. So there's no chemicals, pesticides, fertilizers, etc. You know, there's different farming techniques. They plant certain uh, trees that ward off the insects. They rotate the crop sometimes, you know, so they have different methods. Cow dung, you know, there's different methods that they use to ward off disease and insects. So they probably have the traditional knowledge the native knowledge of growing trees and the farmers are using it to grow tea more sustainably. Exactly. Going forward, what are your plans? We just keep plugging away. You know, COVID was not, two years was not that great for us just because we lost all our food service business overnight. We're starting to rebound from that, thank goodness. And uh, we're, we're launching some new products this year that we're excited about. So we'll just keep plugging away. If you had to put a dollar amount for your impact, your total dollar amount in the last 10, 20 years, what would that be? Social. I know that uh, in the past 20 years, we have spent over a million dollars in terms of our fair trade impact, what we've purchased. I would up that another good 500,000 at least in terms of other social impacts through the NUMI Foundation. So the NUMI Foundation has been been active over the last good 10 years in different programs, including Together for Hope. What is NUMI Foundation doing now? So when we did the Together for Hope project in India, the woman on the tea estate identified that lack of access to menstrual pads was really impeding their development. So women were missing work and girls were missing school an average of three days a month. I've partnered with a group called Arts for Action. I'm an artist. We are right now doing an art sale fundraiser um, on artsforaction.com to raise $46,000 
to provide the women and girls what they need on those tea gardens so that they can stay in school and work for the next two years. So we're very excited about that. It provides the whole village of those females what they need so they can have a seamless life, something that we so take for granted here in the United States. And that basic need as a woman opens a complete Pandora's box of uh, basic needs which get overlooked. Totally. Yeah. So what are the channels of distribution? Where could I buy Nomi tea? So you can find it at your local grocery store or your local natural food store. So if you have a, a Whole Foods or a Sprouts or a Safeway or, you know, dip, not, it's not in all grocery stores, but it's definitely in the natural food stores. And you also sell to restaurants, like maybe airport lounges. Yes, yes. We are in the United Airport Lounges. We are in thousands of restaurants and coffee shops across the country. We're in universities across the country. Uh, we're in the Cheesecake Factory, I think. Yeah, so you'll find us in different food service outlets across the country and across the world, too. Wishing you all the best, Reem. Thank you so much for coming on Mindful Businesses. Thank you. You're listening to Mindful Businesses, produced and hosted by Vidya Ayer. We would love to hear from you. Send us an email to info at mindfulbusinessespodcast.com. If you learned a thing or two, share it with one friend. Click on the subscribe button to be the first to learn about our latest episodes. We recorded this podcast in Buffalo, New York. Theme music by Tatum Gale. Roseanne Korean is our marketing assistant. Kathan Karat edits our podcast. Constant Thurman of Cora Insights is our nonprofit consultant. Our advisors are Jim Stone and Anupama Pushrita. This is Vidya Ayer with Mindful Businesses.